Hello and welcome. So glad that you've joined us at Neighborhood Church, both in person and online. My name is Jen Ashby, and I have a question to get you starting to think this morning. If you want to drop your answer to this question in the online chat, you could certainly do that. The question is this. Where do you feel stuck? Where do you feel stuck in life right now? That's something that we're going to be exploring together this morning. Adora and Daniel are here to lead us in worship, so let's enter in. God. Okay. Amen. Amen. <laughs> the devil is a liar. Okay. The song we're about to sing actually says, um, Every praise is to our God. Every word of worship is to our God. If you know God is deserving of your praise, just say, I thank you, Jesus. I bless you. You know, we can talk to him, right? We can just tell him how we feel. And just bless him for who he is. I love to worship. I just love to praise because God is so awesome. And if you will join me with clapping your hands like this. Come on, let's go. Every praise is to our God. And every word of worship with one accord. Every praise, every praise is to our God. Sing hallelujah to our God. Glory hallelujah is to our God. Every praise, every praise is to our God. Come on, you can sing with me. Every praise, every praise is to our God. Come on. And every word of worship with one accord. Every praise, every praise is to our God. Sing hallelujah. Sing hallelujah to our God. Glory hallelujah is to our God. Every praise. Go! 
We're about to do this song. It's just a song of worship. I think Pastor said it's from the archives, right? <laughs> so we all know the song. And so you don't even need to learn. Just sing out of your spirit and just worship him with every word in the song. Lord, Lord, we are here. We just want to worship you. That's all we want to do this morning. Just bless your name, Jesus. Thank you for being there for us. Thank you for waking us up this morning. Thank you for your grace, your mercy over our lives. My Jesus, my Savior, Lord, there is none like you. days I want to praise the wonders of your mighty love my comfort my shelter tower of refuge and strength And all that I am will never cease to worship you. Oh, shout to the Lord, all the earth, let us sing. Power and majesty, praise to our King. Jesus, my Jesus. 
want to praise the wonders of your mighty love, the wonders of your mighty love. Oh, my comfort, my, hey, my, you're the tower of refuge. If your parents are giving you the green light to come this way and right through these doors to our volunteers who are going to take you to the first floor. Parents, if your little ones are two and under, if you would kindly take them all the way down, that would be great. And parents, you'll be able to pick your kids up after the worship service downstairs. So, yep, right through here. You're on the right track. Awesome. The cafe off the foyer will continue to be available for parents who wish to be with their children in the cafe. And for all you neighborhood kids online, remember, we're posting new videos for you every single week on our website. And we can all be praying for our next children's ministry director and the rebuilding of this vital team. Praise God we have kids in our church. <laughs> <laughs> Praise God we have kids in our church. Awesome, awesome. Well, again, welcome to Neighborhood Church, where we are being transformed by Jesus, empowered by the Holy Spirit, launched on mission. My name is Jen. We want to know what your name is. So would you please take a moment and fill out a Connect card in the seat back in front of you, or if you're online, there's an online card. And if you're using paper connect cards or prayer cards today, then you can just leave them right over here in this box at the end of the service when you depart. 
I hope that you're following us on social media and going to our website regularly. It's neighborhoodc.org. And that's where you can find details about everything I'm going to talk about today and a lot more. So it's an important place you want to visit regularly. Today we're going to be celebrating communion together. So if you're here in person and you'd like to participate in communion, hopefully you grabbed some elements in the back hall. If you didn't already, you can slip out now and grab some. And if you're online, now would be a good time to get a cracker or a piece of bread and some juice or some sort of liquid so that you're ready to participate in communion. Our August outdoor social is today from 4 to 7 at Needwood Park, and the details about that are on our website. You can see exactly what location we'll be at, what you need to bring, including some food to share. It will be a much more fun meal if there's food. So check that out, RSVP there, that'd be helpful. We'd love to have you today. If you have said yes to Jesus, but you've not yet taken that next important step of water baptism, we have a baptism service coming up one week from today right here. We'd love to talk with you more about that. And if you're interested in participating in that particular baptism service, let us know today, either on your Connect card or through our website. Also next Sunday, if you're newer with us, we want to invite you to stay and have lunch after the worship service. We call this event Meet the Staff. And it's an opportunity for those who are newer to get to know others who are newer and also get to know the staff a little bit and vice versa. You can RSVP for that through our website. Please do that by Friday so that we're in good shape for that luncheon event. Neighborhood Youth, which is for students 6th through 12th grade, have a glow night coming up on Friday, August 27th. That'll be at First Alliance Church in Silver Spring. Again, details on the website. Through all of these announcements, are you getting the message that here at Neighborhood Church we are reconnecting and rebuilding? Is that coming through? Are you getting the overall theme? Well, we want to invite you to use your gifts and be part of that. Church is not something that we watch, whether that's in person or online. Church is our life together as believers around the purposes of God. And so we want to invite you to use your gifts and invest in the kingdom. We have a variety of different opportunities, and we would love to help you find the one that invests in eternity and is a good fit for you. So please check that out on our website. We would love to talk with you more. Thank you for your generous giving in this season. There's a variety of pathways through which you can do that. All of them work. We appreciate them all. Let's join our hearts together in prayer this morning. God, this morning we honor you. We bow before you. We kneel before you. We lift our eyes up and we honor you. We acknowledge you and we recognize you as a creator and the sustainer of all things. You are the author of life. It is only because of you that we can live or move or even have being. You are worthy of our full attention. You're worthy to be our first priority. You are worthy to be our fondest affection. You are worthy to be at the very center of everything we think, everything we say, and everything we do. You are worthy. You deserve it. But God, we acknowledge we don't always live that way. We get distracted. We chase after other things. We find ourselves putting other things ahead of you. We find ourselves operating independently of you or even in willful opposition to you. We sin. We confess. And God, even now as your spirit moves amongst us and brings things into light in our own minds and hearts, as your spirit moves among us to convict and put your finger on those specific things you want to convict us of, 
we acknowledge them and we confess. God, we also acknowledge your forgiveness that has been provided at tremendous cost to you the cost of your son on the cross. We acknowledge your forgiveness and we receive it afresh today. We welcome your forgiveness, your cleansing, your restoration, your power to redeem, your power to adjust, <laughs> your power to make good and bring good out of even some of the things that we have done. We are so grateful. We're grateful that we can come into your presence, not with shame, but freely being restored as your children. God, thank you. We stand in a waterfall, in an overwhelming waterfall of your goodness, your generosity, your love, your extravagance. Our blessings are too many to count. We are grateful. We are grateful. We're aware, God, that Ourselves, our families, our community, our nation, our world is dependent on you and in need of your mercy and your intervention. And so we intercede on behalf of those who are in the midst of crisis today. God, we lift up people in the Middle East living in the context of ongoing strife and upheaval and violence, and we say, Lord, have mercy. We lift up the people of Haiti today who are reeling from the effects of this earthquake. And God, we say, have mercy. We lift up people in Japan and in Turkey, in both places where there are tremendous floods happening now and people are trying to survive. God, we ask, Lord, would you have mercy? We lift up our whole world still bearing the weight of COVID and all of the dynamics that flow from that. And God, we say, would you have mercy? God, we pray for your church, your people all around the world, including us, that you would show us how to bear your image in the midst of these circumstances, how to care for one another, and how to share and show you to those who don't yet know you. God, I pray over these six backpacks on the platform representing six students that we're helping to send back to school this fall, clients of Montgomery County Coalition for the Homeless. And as we fill these backpacks with supplies and get them into the hands of students and families, we pray your blessing on them. We pray they'd come to know you. We pray that they have everything that they need to flourish and that you be glorified in their lives. And God, keep us aware of other ways in which you're asking us to lean in in small and big ways, individually and collectively, show us how you're asking us to lean in to your purposes. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. We pray these things in your son's name. Amen. Sorry, I got thrown off a little bit. Kyle Lott's gonna come and lead us in communion. Thank you, Jen. Uh, as Jen mentioned, I know in my house, this is a great time to get those uh, goldfish and the apple juice ready. So James and Evelyn, that's your cue. Um, our God is a powerful God, and he can work through many, many different elements. Uh, hello, my name is Kyle, and I volunteer here with the youth group. Um, I am also an elder here at Neighborhood Church. Um, and, you know, I've been reading uh, through Acts uh, and Luke, the book of Luke, and uh, recently I've been struck um, with how Jesus' gift of internal life is not only for uh, the Jewish believers, but the Gentiles as well. Um, and this is good news. This is good news for all of us. But it also is something that um, even today was a radically different worldview. The idea that the other, the outcast, you and me could and wanted to be welcomed at a table of a king 
of a king is a powerful image of God's love for us and a rejection of what the world sees as value. On the night that he was betrayed, our Lord our Jesus took bread and broke it. And he did this to show how his body was going to be broken. He then poured out wine for the to show how his blood would be poured out for the forgiveness of sins for his Jewish friends that were sitting there with him. But he was doing that for us too, because he saw you, he saw me sitting here in 2021, in the midst of COVID, in the midst of our struggles, in the midst of the things that we are dealing with, and he knew he knew that we would be here. We, he knew we would come to this table. And we are able to come to this table because of that great sacrifice that Jesus made that resulted in the forgiveness of sins. At Neighborhood Church, we practice what is called open communion. It means that if you have accepted Jesus as your Lord and Savior, you are welcome to this table. And I would encourage you to to think about that, the open invitation that Jesus has. Um, in a few minutes, or in a couple of seconds, I will pray, and then invite you uh, to, to take these elements together. If you have said yes to Jesus, um, as we take these elements, I want you to think about the ways that Jesus has, has forgiven you, the, the ways that uh, your life has been changed through that decision. And have joy. Have joy that together we can come to this table and we can eat together. So, let us pray. Father God, we thank you so much for the gift of your son, Jesus. We thank you, Lord God, for the gift of this day that we are alive, that we are able to get another chance to say yes to you, to get another chance to say yes to your kingdom, to say yes to the things that you have placed in our lives. We pray, Lord God, that, that you would work in and through us, Lord God, that, um, as Jen mentioned, that you would move in us and, and, and empower us in those ways that you want us to help serve you and your kingdom, Lord God, that you would give us the strength, the courage, Lord God, um, as you told Moses, Lord God, that you would give us um, uh, the capacity to be brave and the strength of will to work out your, your, um, the ways you want to work through us. We give this time to you, Lord God, and we thank you for this meal. So. On the night he was betrayed, Jesus took the bread, and he broke it, and he said, take, eat this in remembrance of me. Let's take the bread. In the same way, after dinner, he took the cup, and he poured it out, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood, poured out for the forgiveness of sins in remembrance of me. Let's take the cup. For as often as we eat this bread, we drink this cup, we proclaim our Lord's death until he comes again. Thank you, Kyle. I highly doubt at the uh, original Last Supper that Jesus struggled with opening these little plastic cups. So for any of you who struggled that morning, Jesus cannot sympathize with you on that. He had a cup in front of him. <laughs> but, but it's so great to be in person. Thank you for joining us online. It's always good to be together. And today we continue our series in the book of Daniel, Positioned for a Purpose. And let me remind you, as I have again and again and again remind you, God has positioned each and every one of you for a purpose. You are not an accident. It's not even a, a chance that you are here this morning or watching online or listening after. God has positioned you for a purpose. 
And the amazing picture is that when we make our lives all about us, they become small, shriveled shells of who we're meant to be. But when we make our lives all about him, our savior, about his kingdom, he can exponentially use and bless and expand our lives for his glory and purposes. We have seen this again and again as we've talked through the book of Daniel, and you probably have many examples of how God is still doing that today as God uses empires and individuals to ultimately glorify himself. Now, today's message is titled, Go Back to Go Forward. Now, this is a popular phrase that was coined by Pete Scazzaro in his book, Emotionally Healthy Spirituality, but this message really isn't based off of that. But what I mean by this statement, go back to go forward, is to move into God's purposes, we need to go back and see if there are things that are holding us back in our past. Or to put it a different way, Where you are currently at, spiritually, emotionally, physically, relationally, financially, is a direct connection to what has happened in your past. Because where you have come from affects where you are and affects where you are going. And to go forward, oftentimes we need to go back. So let me tell you where I've come from. I was raised in a middle, lower class, Midwestern family in Wisconsin. I learned growing up that you work hard to get things. Yes, I had food, shelter, the basic things, got Christmas, birthday presents, all that. But if we wanted much beyond that, you'd work hard to get that. That's why I began a paper route before I was old enough to have a paper route. That's why in high school, I worked around 20 hours a week while I was going to high school and then moved into full-time work not long after that. Also, I'm the third born. Any third borns here online? Yeah, third borns? I like you guys (laughs) and ladies. But I'm a third born and I had two older brothers. So at times I lived in a shadow of my older brothers. I remember at times just growing up in general, being bullied and belittled, and at times questioning my own value and worth. I've also in my past experienced loss. I lost grandparents, other relatives. I lost a brother, my father, many friends to drug, drugs, alcohol, and suicide. And on top of that, I've dealt with health issues in my immediate family and beyond. And all these things are part of who I am. That's where I am today, but my past affects who I presently am and also where I'm going. So now you might be asking, well, how can I change my past, Mark? It's already done. That bell's been rung, those things have happened, and how can I change what's already been done? Well, great question. And here's what I believe. You can change your past by allowing God to transform its effect on you. Let me say that again. You can change your past by allowing God to transform its effect on you. No matter how many Marvel or DC movies you've watched and universes you have experienced, time travel is not quite a reality, all right? And even if we were able to go back, I'm not quite sure after watching all those movies if we really want to tinker with the past in that way. But we can allow God to transform the past effect on us. Now in Daniel 9, most of this chapter, which we're going to be in today, is a prayer by Daniel. But I want to talk about the beginning and the end of the chapter before we get into the meat in the middle. But that's where we're going to camp in the end. So let me talk about the beginning. Let me talk about the end. And then we'll get to the middle about going back to go forward. So we read in verses 1 and 2 of Daniel this. It was the first year of the reign of Darius the Mede, the son of Ahasuerus, who became king of the Babylonians. During the first year of his reign, I, Daniel, learned from reading the word of the Lord as revealed to Jeremiah the prophet that Jerusalem must lie desolate desolate for 70 years. So chapter 9 parallels the time of chapter 6, the period of King Darius. King Darius is in his first year of power over the Babylonians as the ruler of the Persian Empire. 
Daniel is reading from the book of Jeremiah. And it's about 70 years that the Jews have been in exile in this nation of Babylon. Now, the two references that Daniel was probably reading from Jeremiah was Jeremiah 25, 11 and 29, 10 to 14. Both reference that Jerusalem and the Israel, Israeli people were going to be in captivity for 70 years. And Daniel, if you read closer in those passages, is seeing that the reason that this nation is in captivity is because of their rebellion. They did not listen to God. They didn't listen to the servants of God. They did not live, listen to the prophets of God. They worshiped idols. And because of their past rebellion, God brought disaster on their present situation. The Jewish people, in a sense, were getting what they deserved for what they had done in rebellion against God. 70 years of captivity. Why is it that when something goes wrong, do we blame God? Why is it on your insurance policy, see, an act of God is always something negative and destructive? Why is it that when people have something go well, they forget to pay, praise God, but when the wheels fall off, they right away curse God? It's because we love to blame others for the condition that we're in. It's much easy to, easier to place blame than take personal responsibility. Daniel is not ignoring his own personal responsibility or the responsibility of the nation of Israel for their captivity. It was not God's fault they were in captivity. It was because of Israel's rebellion against God. So here's Daniel. He's probably around 80 years old here. He's been in captivity the majority of his life, and he sees that the 70 years life captivity is coming to an end. He could have just looked and said, well, I read it. I believe it. God said it. He's going to do it and passively sat there. But instead he said, I'm going to do something even though the end is in sight. And what did he do? He prays. He prays that this captivity would come to an end. And we'll get into this prayer in a moment because this is the launching off point of the prayer, but let's fast forward to the end of Daniel 9. Take a look at that, and then we'll jump in the middle. And I want to talk shortly about verses 20 to 27. If you have a Bible, if you're on the YouVersion app, all the notes are in there. But in verses 20 to 27, this is where, in response to Daniel's prayer, the angel Gabriel shows up and begins to lay out a framework for the future, for the timeline of Israel and the world. Now, let me remind you, Israel is not the church, and the church is not Israel. Let me also remind you that Daniel is a Jew who is praying about the future and current condition of a certain nation at a certain time, the Jewish people and the nation of Israel. <clears throat> so when the angel Gabriel comes, he's addressing specifically what Daniel's praying about, the future of the nation of Israel. Now I'm going to get into a little math here. So for Evan Homan and any other math people, uh, you're going to enjoy this moment. <clears throat> for some of you, could I have that bottle of water? For some of you, you might glaze over for a second here. So here's a timeline. Here's some things that begins to get laid out. The angel Gabriel says to Daniel, there's a purpose, there's a plan for the nation of Israel. And in verse 24 specifically, he talks about a period of 70 sets of seven, which becomes known now to us as the 70 weeks of Daniel. These weeks are understood to be years. So, and then in verse 25, a reference is made to seven sets of seven and 62 sets of seven will pass from the time the command is given to rebuild Jerusalem until the ruler of the anointed one comes. In other words, there will be 483 years, we can look in history and see this now, from when King Artaxerxes in 445 BC issues a decree to rebuild Jerusalem and the temple. There'll be 483 years from that 
moment until the triumphal entry and death of Jesus in AD 30. We can look back historically and see what was given to Daniel prophetically happened through history. So that leaves 69 weeks completed, 70th week is still to come. Now, little is said about here about the 70th week of Daniel, but if we parallel with other portions of Scripture, like the book of Revelation, we can clearly see there'll be a period of time, which is seven years, where there's this great struggle, or it's being, come to be known as the Great Tribulation, that will culminate with the second coming of Jesus. Ultimately, God's purpose and plans will be fulfilled. If you want to dig deeper into all these details today, just Google prophecy and you will have a boatload. But it's incredible. I just want you to take away two things from here. One, God is revealing his purpose to his people. If we are willing to pray and seek God, he will reveal his purposes for your life and even for nations and kingdoms. What an incredible concept. I know there's some dodgy prophets out there right now, so don't sign up for the whole prophetic thing real quickly. But God is revealing his purposes to his people. Second, your prayers make a difference. And God responds to your prayers. When you pray, God works. God responds. From those prayers of Daniel, that is why the angel Gabriel was sent. So now let's take a look at the middle of the chapter here. So let's look at verse 3. So I turned to the Lord God and pleaded with him in prayer and fasting. I also wore rough burlap and sprinkled myself with ashes. I prayed to the Lord my God and confessed. Now just remember, he had recognized that the nation of Israel was in captivity for 70 years because of their rebellion. And his response from there, he puts on sackcloth and ashes, which is a sign of mourning in his culture a sign of humility in his culture. And so the first idea is to go back, take a posture of humility. Daniel was not putting on a show. He was broken over the sin of his people and put on this posture of humility in mourning and sackcloth and ashes. Daniel is desperately seeking God's intervention on behalf of himself and his nation. To go back, we need to take a posture of humility. Verse four, O Lord, you are a great and awesome God. You always fulfill your covenant and keep your promises of unfailing love to those who love you and obey your commands. But we have sinned and done wrong. We have rebelled against you and scorned your commands and regulations. We have refused to listen to your servants, the prophets, who spoke on your authority to our kings and princes and ancestors and to all the people of the land. Lord, you are right but as, as you see, our faces are covered with shame. This is true of all of us, including the people of Judah and Jerusalem and all Israel scattered near and far, wherever you have driven us because of our disloyalty to you. O oh Lord, we and our kings, princes, and ancestors are covered with shame because we have sinned against you. But the Lord our God is merciful and forgive, <clears throat> forgiving, even though we have rebelled against him. We have not obeyed the Lord our God, for we have not followed the instructions he gave us through his servants and prophets. All Israel has disobeyed your instructions and turned away, refusing to listen to your voice. So first, go back. To go back, take a posture of humility. Next, to go back, be brutally honest. In these six verses, you don't see Daniel making any excuses for himself, or for his people. He could have said, well, life is hard, or these people influenced us, or this happened that was out of our control. There was none of that. It was simply a brutal, honest look at the nation. And you hear Daniel recognizing the character of God and confessing the sins of the nation of Israel. Daniel's not trying to defend himself or the nation but recognizes the reason the nation is where it is is because of their rebellion against God. Let's be honest. Take a look at your own life. 
Many of us are where we are because we have disregarded God's word and his commands for our lives. Nobody is going to raise their hand and admit that very readily. But the reality is that many of our families, many of our own lives, many, much of our society as a whole are in positions because we have either willfully disobeyed, haven't known, or ignored the commands of God. We need to be brutally honest <clears throat> about what is going on within ourselves. We have to take a look at our families, our church, our nation, and confession to God is where we begin. We confess to God where we have gone wrong, where we have failed, where we haven't honored God or obeyed God. Because to get where God wants us to go, we need to take a brutal, honest look at our lives and our past. Well, verse 11. So now, because of how they live, so now the solemn curses and judgments written in the law of Moses, the servant of God, have been poured down on us because of our sin. You have kept your word and done to us and our rulers exactly as you warned. Never has there been such a disaster as happened in Jerusalem. Every curse written against us in the law of Moses has come true. Yet we have refused to seek mercy from the Lord our God by turning from our sin and recognizing his truth. Therefore, the Lord has brought upon us the disaster he prepared. The Lord our God was right to do all these things for we did not obey him. He continues on with brutal honesty, but on top of that, to go back, we need to recognize the consequences. The things that have happened in our past have consequences now. And Daniel is recognizing what the nation did in the past. He is on the receiving end of those consequences. In the past, God had revealed to the nation of Israel his expectations for them, but they disobeyed, and there was consequences. And Dan, Daniel clearly would have known the law of Moses. And if you rewind to Leviticus 26, it clearly lays out the rebellion and the consequences for rebellion against God's law. And it says if you continue to rebel, they knew, according to Leviticus 26, their land would be desolate and they would be sent to foreign nations. God warned them. God told them. But they ignored it. And Daniel is simply reflecting on the consequences he knew to be true from knowing the word of God and what had already been spoken. Don't you hate the phrase, I told you so? How many like hearing that phrase said to you? I told you so. All of us have probably heard it said to us, said it to somebody else, or thought it that we wanted to say it to somebody else. And usually it comes after us being told something or us telling somebody else something. Kids, go clean up your room. Don't drink and drive. Don't date that person. Obey God. Choose a good path. Are you sure you want to open up your life to these things? And then when we make decisions that aren't following good counsel, you hear the words in your own, own mind are spoken to you, I told you so. And Daniel is kind of saying this to the Jewish people, that they knew the right thing to do, just like we do, but they did not do it, and now they're dealing with the consequences of their actions. I told you so. Ouch. Unlike many in our current cultural climate, I believe in absolute truth. That there is a God who has an eternal, universal laws as part of his character that are eternally and universally true. 
We find out through scripture that this God is a just and merciful God. He's a loving and fair God. And when he makes it a law, it is not for our harm, but it's for our good. But when we rebel against those laws of God, there's consequences to those rebellions. From simple things like the law of gravity that God thought up, to laws pertaining to life and fair treatment of others, to things that we are meant to worship God and God alone, God is just and right in making eternal, universal laws that when disobeyed have consequences to them. We can say, I don't believe in that God. I don't believe in these universal truths, but that does not change the consequences that play out in our own lives, in our families, in our communities, in our nation and the world when we rebel against God's eternal universal laws. And these consequences that come are just, are fair, are loving, because that is who our God is. I also recognize that there are many things that happen in our lives and consequences we experience that are out of our control. If you have been on the receiving end of abuse, of racism, of discrimination, those are not things that are right or good. And ultimately, there will be consequences for the perpetrators of that, according to God's universal law. But we need to make decisions of how we're going to even respond to things that we're on the receiving end of that are not our fault. If I have been abused by somebody, that is not right, that is not good, and I pray for the full line of justice to be done for that person who has abused you or me. But I also have the ability of how I'm going to respond to that abuse and what I'm going to let the narrative become in my heart and mind. I can make a decision to become bitter and angry and unforgiving and wanting nothing but retribution, or I can take on the character of Jesus and say, I choose to forgive and allow God to work in my life so it doesn't destroy me. But that does not negate the consequences of our own rebellion. (laughs) When we rebel against the universal nature of God's law and character, there will be consequences. And Daniel is not the one, per se, that rebelled against God 70 plus years earlier, but he is recognizing the consequence he's receiving. And in a collectivist society, you recognize that all of what we do relates to one another. That we are not independent entities, but collectively together, that sin can affect all of us. And so Daniel willingly recognizes and confesses his rebellion. To go back, recognize the consequences. Verse 15. O Lord, our God, you brought lasting honor to your name by rescuing your people from Egypt in a great display of your power. But we have sinned and are full of wickedness. In view of all your faithful mercies, Lord, please turn your fierce anger away from your city, Jerusalem, your holy mountain. All the neighboring nations mock Jerusalem and your people because of our sins and the sins of our ancestors. O our God, O our God, hear your servant's prayer. Listen as I plead. For your own sake, Lord, smile again on your desolate sanctuary. O oh my God, lean down and listen to me. Open your eyes and see our despair. See how your city, the city that bears your name, lies in ruins, speaking about Jerusalem. We make this plea not because we deserve help, but because of your mercy. O oh Lord, hear. O oh Lord, forgive. O oh Lord, listen and act for your own sake. Do not delay. O oh my God, for your people in your city, bear your name. I went on praying and confessing my sin and the sins of my people, pleading with the Lord my God for Jerusalem, his holy mountain. You can see that Daniel is praying in a specific direction that God would bring Jerusalem back to his former glory, but it's going to take repentance. It's going to take dealing with the past, being able to go forward. 
And this is the end of Daniel's prayer, but let me just take you back to the beginning of my message where I pulled out how the angel Gabriel responded to this prayer. And what did the angel Gabriel say? He laid out a future for the nation of Israel. He didn't say, here's your past. He said, no, 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 there's going to be a future for you. And if you go over to Jeremiah 29, 11, which I referenced, for I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. Sound like a familiar verse? That verse in context was actually about God's future plan for Israel once they were coming out of their 70 years of captivity. We love to put it on plaques, and I'm not saying it doesn't apply to your life, but according to the context, it was saying to the nation of Israel, when you repent, when you return to me, when you discover and renew yourselves to the purposes of God, I have a future for you. I have a plan for you. I have hope for you. I have life for you. But first, you need to deal with your past. And clearly, God was saying through the angel Gabriel, to the nation of Israel, I'm not done with you. I'm not finished with you. I have something for you. And he says the same to us. He's not done with you. He's not finished with you. He has a hope, a future, a plan for you. But we need to take a posture of humility. We need to be brutally honest about our lives and our past. We need to recognize the consequences of our own sin and rebellion. But when we do all this, we can't just live in the past. We need to go forward. And how do we go forward? We go forward by receiving God's mercy and forgiveness. You can't move forward on your own strength. You can't find it within yourself. That is why Jesus came. And Daniel, even though he is on the other side of the life death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus, he has saw glimmers of what was to come. And in Jesus, we see, and throughout Scripture, we see that God created us to be with him. We're ultimately created for his glory, but when we sin and rebel against God's known laws, we deal with the consequences of that rebellion. And we can't make it right with God, but God makes it right for us through the death and resurrection of Jesus. Through the cross of Christ, he opens up a way for us to be restored in relationship with God so that we can return to him. He deals with the ugly consequences of our actions and rebellions and says, I don't only want to give you life now, but life forever. I want to give you a future, not just here, but for all of eternity. That is the invitation of God that we need to go back and allow him to deal with our past so we can walk into the life and live into the future that God has given to us. We can receive mercy, eternal life, forgiveness, grace, a member of God's kingdom, his family, his purposes. We receive the spirit of promise in the full restoration one day. We are under the flood of God's mercy, grace, and forgiveness if we are only willing to receive it. If we're willing to deal with our past, we can move forward into God's purposes. But it's only through his mercy. It's not your hard work. It's not because you're so great in yourself. It's only by the mercy of God. As we conclude here, I want you to take a moment and I want you to reflect on your life and where you've come from. What's your story? And I want you to ask yourself this simple question. What is holding me back from moving forward with God's purposes? What is holding you back? Even today, when I was out for a run, even this morning, in the earlier hours as we were trying to get things off the ground here and things were not going well, because of some technical issues. I need to go before God and confess some things <laughs> that were gonna hold me back from getting up here and fulfilling God's purposes for my life today. For some of us, it's something small. But for others, as I've been talking today, you're saying, there's this thing in my past that I just don't wanna deal with. I don't want to open that door 
It's too painful. Maybe it's too big. Maybe it's too sinful in your mind. But what is it that is holding you back? And I trust that even as I've talked there, that God, if necessary, is bringing something to your mind. And I want you to hold on to it for a moment, but I don't want you to hold on to it forever. Because God brings up these things so we can deal with them. For some of you, it might be a simple prayer of confession right now. That you say, God, forgive me for this, cleanse me, help me to walk into your purposes. For others, it's maybe the beginning of a journey of some deep soul work that God wants to do in you to take care of your past so you can move into his future. For the nation of Israel, it seemed like they needed 70, wor- 70 years to work on some of those things going on in the inside. And hopefully it's not that long for you. But I'd encourage you to take that journey to go back so that we can go forward into what God has for us. God has a plan for the nation of Israel and God has a plan for you and I. To move into those plans, we need to go back to go forward. Let's pray together. Father, I pray that you would meet with us this morning or whenever we're listening or watching this. God, I pray if there are things within our own soul that we are holding on to, that are holding us back from your purposes, today is the day to deal with them. God, may we confess those things to you. May we bring those things into the light and allow you to do a deep transformative work in us so that we can walk into your purposes. God, I pray that you give my sisters and brothers the courage to deal with whatever is in their past, that you give them the support of people around them to walk with them, that we could walk into your glorious freedom. And God, I believe that you are wanting to do a deep work in our lives, just like you were doing in Daniel's, that you're having him unpack his past and the past of the nation so that he could be free to walk into your current and future purposes. And may the same be true for us. May we go back so we can go forward into your purposes. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. We have a beautiful God, a wonderful God that is willing to forgive us and just let it go. So we can't hold on to stuff. We have to let it go. Because God wants to help us. So the song we're taking today, if you can stand to your feet, says, what a beautiful name it is. What a wonderful name it is. What a powerful name the name of Jesus is. What he's able to do for us.
What a beautiful name it is, the name of Jesus Christ, my King. What a beautiful name it is, nothing compares to His. What a beautiful name it is, the name of Jesus. Amen. Thank you for joining us at Neighborhood Church, both in person and online. Today is the third Sunday of the month, Communion Sunday, which means we're providing bagged breakfasts to the men at the emergency shelter. I want to thank Sarah and Keith Luce and Kathy Boss, who have been faithfully fulfilling this commitment on our behalf during these bizarre COVID times. A reminder, parents, you're going to go down to the first floor now and pick up your children. And to all of you, we'd love to see you out at Needwood at 4 o'clock. God bless you.